This is Your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 76. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Well, welcome back, CBT School community, and I'm so thrilled to have you here for another episode of your Anxiety Toolkit podcast. It is the day after Thanksgiving, and I could not be more grateful for you guys. I am so overwhelmed with joy when I think about you guys and about how many brave, courageous things you guys are doing. And I am so incredibly thankful for your support and leadership. I will say you guys are a part of the leadership here in that you give me a lot of really inspiration myself because I'm hearing all these amazing stories that you're doing. And I can't tell you, I really can't. I get teary just at the thought of telling you guys and sharing with you guys how much you, I appreciate you. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Today's episode is a little different. It may even little sound a little different. And that is because we have been having some major technical issues over here on your anxiety toolkit. My wonderful editor has been trying to help me troubleshoot some recording issues that we're having. And I had no choice but to record this on my own personal recording headphones. And I'm just going to wing it today. And so um, hang in here because this is actually going to be all very synchronistic by the time we finish the episode because what I had already planned for this recording is to share with you my personal experience with anxiety. I have been slowly but surely coming to a place where I feel ready to share my own personal experience As a therapist and as a clinician, I don't usually share about my experience very much. My clients do get pieces here and there when I'm trying to share a story with them or a tool that I want them to understand or to validate their own experience. So I do share it sometimes with my clients, but usually within a very limited capacity because You know, the ethical practice of clinicians is that if we share too much, it can sometimes interfere with the clinical relationship. But that being said, I do believe and I have been led and inspired by so many other clinicians who have shifted to being more of an advocate and talking about their own struggles to normalize mental illness and to help us all come together and feel like we're a part of a big, happy team and family. And over the last year, I've had multiple, uh, more than multiple, so many people reach out and say, do you even get this? How do you get this if you don't have anxiety or you don't have OCD or you don't have panic disorder, how do I trust you? How do I know that you get this? And, you know, I've always gone under the story that my supervisor has given me, which is, you know, you don't have to have delivered a baby to be able to deliver a baby. (laughs) And while it does help to know what the person's going through, you can be very, very trained without going through exactly what my clients have gone through and what you guys have gone through. And even if I had, you know, one of the disorders that you may have, I wouldn't have it in the exact presentation. And so I never really felt like I needed to share my story. But I feel at this point that it's actually as much of a growth period for me as it would be maybe helpful for you to just know that I am one of your people 
And I just really felt that it might be helpful for you guys to get to know me a little bit better and for you guys to hear my story. Now, most of what we talk about here is mindfulness and tools. And and if for any reason you're not at all interested, I will not be offended. Really, like I said, the main purpose of me coming to this place today, making the intention to record this podcast today is really just so that we are feel more like we're all on the same team. We're all moving in the same direction. And for you guys to just know that with each person comes a story and with each story comes a chance for us to join hands and fight for mental illness rights and to fight for mental wellness and to destigmatize mental wellness. And so here I am today recording on my imperfect recording equipment, telling my imperfect story, I'm sure, in an imperfect way. But like I said, I feel like it's super synchronistic. I almost feel like maybe the recording setup didn't work because it wasn't supposed to be formal anyway. (laughs) So if you hear dogs barking or you hear fire trucks or the wind blowing, that's because that's what's going on. I'm sitting in my backyard and I'm overlooking this beautiful view and I'm just being so grateful for the fact that our house is here after having a terrible close fires in our area and so grateful for my family And so again, in the name of gratitude, let's just do this. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you the memoir version (laughs) because I know you guys have a life and you don't need to know the memoir version. But what I would like to share with you today is the themes and onset of when I started to really struggle. And that was pretty much the day I left my home which was in the country. I lived in a rural area in Australia, like imagine the most beautiful rolling green hills and beautiful land and cows and horses and greenery and, you know, this amazing family because I am blessed with an amazing family. And I left and I went to probably the, what I would say the closest city just because I didn't want to leave home. I knew I wanted to launch and be an independent adult, but I didn't want to leave. And so I went away and my parents dropped me off. And I had this experience immediately of anxiety, this overwhelming, untethered feeling. I'll go straight to the major theme of my anxiety, which is this phrase that keeps getting repeated in my mind, which is something bad is going to happen. I can't tell you how many times I have heard that phrase in my mind, something bad is going to happen. And when I first moved away from home, it was overwhelming. It was exhausting. It was terrorizing. And a part of me, the intuitive piece of me knew it was normal. I knew that moving away from home and going to university and being an adult was scary But this felt bigger than that. It felt scarier than the normal that everybody else seemed to be going through. And I do remember checking in with some friends that I had made, some new friends that I had made at college and asked them, like, how are you doing? And they all said they were fine or that they were relieved. And I just did not feel that. And I remember sitting on the library steps and thinking, okay, well, if this friend, my best friend, you know, in college said she's doing fine, there there must be something wrong with me and I need to do something about this. But here comes the first line of mental health stigma. I did not ask for help. I did not share it with my family. I did not go to the school counsellor, which they had told me they were available when I first had orientation. I dug deep inside me and doubled down in productivity. I think that's my default. It always has been. I was raised in a family where work ethic is a very, very strong value. And so I doubled down. I assumed that my feeling of being out of control and being alone and being, you know, that possibly some, here we go again, something bad will happen. 
I doubled down on productivity and I moved towards compulsive studying. And when I say compulsive studying, I'm not saying effective studying. I'm talking compulsive studying. And I moved towards compulsive exercise. And when I'm talking about compulsive exercise, I'm talking about overdoing it, you know, not using exercise as a healthy outlet for anxiety, but doing it as a way to get control over my life, control over all the things that I felt were scary. And from there, I actually felt a little bit of relief. I did feel more in control. I did feel less focus was on my core theme that something bad was going to happen. I felt empowered. And the really sad thing is that the world in- reinforced it. I was being told by people how strong I was because I could run so far. I was being told how great I looked because I was exercising so much. I was being told how amazing I am because I could hold down two full jobs and go to college because I, again, compulsively took on a two part-time jobs in addition to a full schedule of school. And the world reinforced my really, really poor coping patterns. And what happened was I did, as you know, as the cycle always plays out when it comes to anxiety, when we try to reduce anxiety with a poor coping mechanism, the fear resides a little, but then before we know it, it's back stronger. And then we have to do more of those coping behaviors that are so poor and ineffective. And what I found is, is that I got myself into a loop of internalizing how I felt, trying not to let anybody see it, overworking, overexercising, and struggling, really struggling. So let me fast forward because you kind of guys, I know you get the themes here now, is fast forward Uh, Three years, I had moved to America and met the man of my dreams and we agreed to get married and we got married in my hometown in Australia and my beautiful parents' front yard. And then I packed two full suitcases of things and clothing and I gave away pretty much everything else or packed everything else away and I left Australia for America. And here I am, a 21-year-old, very naive, anxiety-stricken female (laughs) in a new country and excited and happy and felt like the world was my oyster, but still not having addressed this major anxiety that I was carrying around. And so with Before I Knew It, I had graduated college and I had you know, left my country and I was now living in this new country. And yes, I totally get that Australia isn't that much different to America. We both speak English, that systems are very similar, but it was a culture shock. I'm not going to lie. In the country, I was not allowed to work. I had a husband who was working around the clock because I wasn't allowed to work because of visa reasons. And we didn't have any money. These are, again, the themes that seem to trigger me. You know, I had moved to a country where the government had taken away one of my poor coping behaviors, which is to work. And I was left feeling like I had no clue how to handle it. Right. I was just, you know, the voice of something bad is going to happen was doubling down on me. And so... As you can imagine, when you take away a poor coping mechanism and then you're adding extra stresses like, you know, not having an income and being alone and away from your family and having to meet new people and learn the tiny little intricacies of a new culture, learning what isn't okay to say and learning what Australian terms will make Americans look at you like a crazy person. (laughs) And as I went through this, I had, I felt, I should say, I had that I had no choice but to double down on the few coping behaviors that I had, which was exercise. And so as a newly wedded wife, 
I do remember, and I will say there was one factor, is that somebody at my wedding did make a joke saying that basically they said, what's the difference between a wife and a girlfriend? You know, this person said this to my husband and they were joking, but I took it to heart. And they said, my husband said, I don't know. And he said, ha ha, 15 kilos. And then everyone laughed, but kind of awkwardly laughed. And I awkwardly laughed and pretended like that meant nothing to me. But inside, it meant everything to me. This idea that the only thing that's different between a girlfriend and a wife is 15 pounds or 15 kilos and that that is important freaked me out. And so this is where I went down the road of having, you know, an eating disorder that I used as a coping mechanism for feeling out of control and having massive degrees of anxiety. So fast forward, this is where it gets you know, more serious in my story in that I think you guys can really resonate that once you focus in on something and once you buy into the story that it's important, you get locked into it. There is a cycle that locks you in so tight that you can't see it any other way. You can't see anything else. You can't see any other rationale for what you should be doing. And there was a click that went over for me. It was like a switch when, you know, that person made that joke. And I don't blame them because it's not them that made my brain click over. While it is society's, our work as a society to not push weight equals worth as a concept to humans and females specifically. But I do remember that switch. And from that moment, everything went into turbo in my mind. My anxiety went into turbo. That was the only thing I could think about. Everything I did was based on this outcome of whether I would or would not gain weight everything became crucial to this concept, right? And so there were 11 months where I was unable to work because of my processing of my US visa. And during that 11 months, I went through this pendulum swing of feeling so in control because I did control my life by eating and exercising or restricting and exercising. But then it would swing, that pendulum would swing because once those tools weren't working, I felt more and more out of control than I ever have. Because when you try to control things and you realize you can't, that is the most out of control you will ever feel, right? Some people think that if they don't control things, that that's when they'll feel the most out of control, but that's not true. It's not true. The more you try and control things, the more you feel out of control. And that was so frustrating and so terrorizing for me because it got to the point with my eating disorder that I wasn't able to go to a restaurant without looking up the menu ahead of time and being absolute certain that I could arrange the menu or manage the menu, shift the menu so that they would meet my dietary needs, these special low fat, no fat, high protein, high green rabbit food diet that I was on. And Again, nobody knew I was doing this, not even my husband, I don't think. I couldn't. I remember spending over 45 minutes online and on the phone trying to find out exactly what the airplane, airlines, because I was going to fly home to Australia by myself. And I remember spending 45 minutes on the phone trying to find certainty on what they were going to serve because then I would be in control, then I would know what to eat beforehand and what to eat afterwards. And 
how I could calculate to make sure that I didn't lose control of my life. I remember, (laughs) I'm going to say it's ironic, but not ironic, that I decided that I was going to get trained to become a personal trainer. Of course, it's a very bad lifestyle to choose when you're stuck in this cycle. But I would calculate using one of the first computer programs that helped you calculate calories. I would obsessively enter data to the gram, to the milligram of what I was eating, right? One third of a pita bread slice, one quarter of a lemon one third of a cucumber, you know, I was calculating every little ounce of what I was eating. And again, it was all poor coping. Now, I'm not saying that if you're doing that because you want to be healthy, that you're using a poor coping mechanism. Absolutely not. But in my case, I was doing it as a way to get control. I was doing it as a way to reduce my anxiety and to not feel vulnerable and to not have to tolerate the sensations in my body and experience the uncertainty and vulnerability of living this life, you know, that this very fragile life that we have. And I feel it that way. Still to this day, I feel like life is fragile and vulnerable. And some people might feel like that sounds very dramatic. And it is. (laughs) But I think that's just my genetic makeup. I don't think it's a, a flaw in the way I think. I just know that I'm super sensitive. I'm super awake to our own vulnerabilities too much, I think, in some ways. And therefore, I have to be uber, uber aware and conscious and open to allowing those feelings. But back then, I had no clue. I didn't know that. Back then, if I thought if you felt vulnerable, the solution was to fix it and to make it go away. That's what a good productive human would do. And that was the values in which I was raised. And, you know, again, I didn't know to ask for help. So basically, this is where I got stuck. And then I will say I got stuck because restricting, you know, I don't talk about eating disorders enough. But one thing I will tell you is that restricting will lead to binging. And binging will lead to restricting. And then restricting will lead to binging. And now you have a cycle. And that's exactly the cycle that I got stuck in. I would go for long periods without eating or eating very, very small, low calorie meals and get so shaky and feel so untethered and out of control that I would eat for emotional filler. I would eat my emotions. I would try to make it go away and I would eat. And because I had this idea that any kind of eating was bad, I would consider that eating as binging and then I would double down on my restriction. And I remember going through this cycle of, you know, eating what I considered to be a binge, even though looking back, it's what I would now consider a medium-sized snack. (laughs) But I considered it then to be a binge. And I remember frantically jumping on my bike because I did not have a U.S. license and riding to the YMCA where I was volunteering because that's, you know, the only thing I could find to fill in my time because I didn't have, I didn't know what to do with myself and exercising like crazy just because I'd had this, what I considered to be a binge. And I do remember having a moment of pedaling furiously across a very busy street in the San Fernando Valley here in Los Angeles and thinking, something isn't right here. This isn't good. I don't think anybody else is doing this. This is, Something's off. And having this moment where I started to see that I was in trouble and that I was super stuck. So not long later, my husband had some time off of work and we were talking about doing something. To be honest with you, I don't even remember what it was. But I broke down in tears and I was, you know, I can't do that. We can't do that. How will I do it? I'm so anxious. How will I know what to eat? And 
I let, let it out. I had basically finally just let it out of what I was going through. And he looked at me with a concerned face and he just said, something isn't right. You have to go and get help. And in that moment, I remember being so afraid, but so relieved at the same time of feeling like, oh my God, you're right. I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted and I'm weak. My body is weak. Nobody else thinks that. Everybody else thinks my body is right, right, ripped and, and strong, but my body is so weak and I'm so out of control. And I just, I think I cried for a very long time and I was so afraid of what my family would think if I told them I needed help. And I was so afraid of the money that I would have to spend. You know, that was a big piece of it too, is, you know, I didn't want to admit that I needed help. I didn't want to have to pay somebody else to fix my problem because I had become so inflexible with solutions that I only believed that I had the solution. I only believed that I could fix it and that I would just work harder and I would just do the behaviors, these compensating behaviors more and harder and better and I'd find a solution and I'll tweak it a little. And and there was a moment of letting go when I committed to going to therapy. So I did go to therapy and I met this amazing therapist who treats eating disorders. A friend of mine had referred her to me and she and I worked on a lot of it was family stuff. A lot of it was breaking down the rules that I had clung to, like, you know, productivity equals my worth or my weight equals my worth or that I have to be happy all the time or I'm bothering people. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying my family was at fault here. It's just, that's what I picked up. That's, I had taken all of the information and I pulled out small threads of pieces of that. And I had somehow concreted it into my mind and became very inflexible about those concepts and doubled down on them. And so we worked at length around breaking up those beliefs. But then I want to tell you a story. I remember being in the waiting room of this therapist and hearing, you know, it was coming up to time to where my therapy session was coming up and I remember hearing this yelling coming through the wall and this person said, fine, (laughs) but I'm not eating that linguine. Oh no, actually, I'm sorry. It wasn't linguine. It was fettuccine. She was fine, but I will not eat that fettuccine. And then slam, the door was slammed. I heard some footsteps and some papers rustling. And then my therapist came to the door and opened the door and welcomed me in. And then I kind of looked at her strange, right? Because, you know, I was like, what was that about? And she goes, I'm very sorry. You know, I was talking with my client about eating a food that she was afraid to eat. And I'm so sorry that you had to hear that because it was through the wall. It was so loud. And of course, I wasn't upset. But we started talking about it, about, you know, that why was she, my therapist, asking her to eat fettuccine? Well, she was afraid. And in her mind, fettuccine was a quote unquote bad food. And my therapist was challenging her to eat and do the scary thing. And then we started talking about what good and bad foods mean to me. And the interesting thing was I had a laundry list of good and bad foods. I was a trainer, so I was harping on my clients all day about not eating dairy and not eating sugar and not eating this and not eating that and only eating this. And, and, you know, just pushing on them my own very faulty beliefs and my very limited views on how to eat intuitively and lovingly and genuinely. And so we were talking about it and we came to the decision. It was a Tuesday. I remember it was a Tuesday. And she said, well, what are you going to do for dinner? And I said, well, my husband and I actually plan to go on a date to our favorite Mexican restaurant. And she said, well, what do you usually order? And I said, well, I have the shrimp salad, but I have no croutons and no tortilla chips and the dressing on the side. And 
you know, no cheese and I asked for the vinaigrette and not the creamy one and I this whole list and she was looking at me like I was crazy. And she said, well, what would you like to eat? What sounds delicious? What would you eat on your birthday? Right. And I was like, well, you know, if I had permission to eat without having fear, I'd eat the burrito. And she said, okay, that's what you're having for dinner. (laughs) And I remember freaking out. Oh, my God, I freaked out so hard. It was such a scary day. I'll never forget it. I remember coming and telling my husband I was going to do it. And he was like, okay, (laughs) sure. I always eat the burrito because he, you know, of course, nobody else will get it. And we can't be angry at them for that. We can't be offended that they don't get how painful it is because they just don't. And that's okay. We can't take that as a judgment. He didn't get it. And that's okay. He supported me. And so I ate the burrito. And that was the day where I think I started to see that this idea of control was the actual reason I felt so out of control. And the fact is, is that I had to learn to feel my feelings. I had to learn to feel afraid. I had to learn to allow the thought that something bad is going to happen. I had to learn to have the thought and not get all up and engaged in it. And that was scary. And it took me a very long time. But piece by piece, I stopped counting calories. Piece by piece, I stopped exercising. Piece by piece... I gave myself permission to be whatever weight I was. I won't lie, a big piece of that was giving up being a personal trainer because it was an environment that just kept triggering me with the mirrors and the diet and the exercise talk and the advertisements and the body shaming. And and I feel like that was a big step for me, but most of it was just me feeling my feelings and being empowered enough to say, I am who I am and I get to look however I look and I'm going to lean towards love and trust instead of fear because fear pretty much owned me for about three and a half years. You know, the truth is it has since I was, I left home. I felt very secure at home, but as soon as I left, you know, adulting and I just, we don't get along that well. (laughs) And now I'm coming to peace with that a little bit. And I feel like I'm in a place now where I'm slowly but surely coming to a place where I can allow myself to be completely vulnerable with myself and with my experience and be out of control. What I will add to this story is that When I started to see such growth, that's when I started to become a therapist. And some people I really deeply love were going through their own anxiety. And I started to see that this was just all fear, right? Like my brain was setting off fire alarms and emergency alarms all day long by mistake, you know, over analyzing, over assessing the danger and then, you know, sending the alarms off and I was responding. And that's where I think I really lent towards the work of anxiety. And that's why I do everything I do. And I love what I do because I feel like it doesn't even have to be an anxiety disorder. It could be simply an eating disorder, but anxiety was the fuel. Anxiety is what lit me on fire every morning when I would wake up and the first thing I would think of is, dear God, did I gain weight or dear God, will something bad happen or dear God, you know, what possibly is going to go wrong today? And so that is why, you know, after seeing myself and so many people I love struggling, you know, that's why I shifted. And I hope that you can understand that I was nowhere near recovery when I started becoming a therapist. So I don't want anyone, I've had many people ask, like, you know, I don't feel like I can become a therapist because I'm not fully recovered myself yet. And the truth is, no one in my cohort was recovered. (laughs) You know, we're all in recovery for something. And I don't want you guys to feel like you have to have gone through and totally be on it and be perfect 
before you start to become a therapist because I terribly was not. You know, my cohort when I was in my master's degree to become a therapist saw me have some pretty big size meltdowns (laughs) in class because I had to challenge everything I believed and I had to push through some challenges and barriers that I had held myself to or, you know, limiting beliefs. And that was life-changing for me so much. So that brings me to, you know, getting my degree and getting to this place where now I can still wrestle with that one sentence. And I want to make sure I I don't make it sound like this is a happy ending (laughs) because it's not. I still wake up every day with the thought that something bad's going to happen. The minute I drop my kids off at school, I have the thought that something bad is going to happen. The minute I send out my taxes, I have the thought something bad is going to happen. Like everything is layered with that thought. But that's where I want to really shift. And the reason I wanted to tell this story is it's not the absence of the thoughts that puts me into what I would consider recovery. It's really opening up space and not getting caught up in the drama of those thoughts. The tizzy that can be created with those very conniving sentence starters, right? Like something bad is going to happen. That's a sentence starter in my mind. It's a sentence that starts where you could finish the sentence with a whole paragraph about all the things that could go wrong. And I work every day to not get caught up in the drama of my limbic system, (laughs) that part of my brain that sets off the alarm. And I, I label it as drama. I label it as thoughts. And I come back to what I value. I'm not going to lie. Having children has made me have to challenge this more than ever. Because now not only am I, could I lose myself and my husband, but I could lose two most amazing miracles that I have in my whole entire life, which are those children. It's parenting is such a vulnerable place to live. But again, the more I let go of control, the more I have peace with my own vulnerability. And if I catch myself trying to get control is when I feel the most out of control. And I just have to keep reminding myself of that. So again, I'm not going to tell you every detail. Number one, you don't need to know because they're the main pieces. But I do want you guys to understand a couple of things and let me share a couple of weeks ago as I was prepping to do this I was talking myself through whether I wanted to talk about myself my overwhelming fear was that I didn't have a good enough story that it wasn't bad enough that I didn't lose everything that it's not groundbreaking and that therefore I shouldn't tell it And I think that we all do that. We tell ourselves that our story doesn't matter, that our story isn't worthy of being heard. It's not worthy of being told to a therapist, being told to a friend, to your partner, to your family, that it's not bad enough, right? And that we compare with others and we feel guilty for asking for help. And I really want to empower you guys that if if for any reason you feel like there is a story you're telling yourself that is getting in the way of you asking for help, please don't do that. Please honor that you deserve help and that you deserve to share, right? You're allowed to advocate because, you know, we're all struggling in some way. The second piece here is some people feel like, and this is again a fear of mine, that it's too bad. There's too much bad. And that people will see me as weak for having these struggles, right? Now, the truth is, I'm telling you this story, and I haven't even told some of my family this story. This is ultimately some kind of mental health coming out. (laughs) It's a coming out story, right? And I'm okay with that. You know, I didn't need to share it until now I felt this strong need to share my story and join you guys in your journey of mental wellness and recovery. 
And so please don't feel like your story isn't enough, but please also don't feel like it's too much because, again, I really do believe that we just keep opening up space for the vulnerability that comes when we let go and we face our fears, right? Because we can do hard things. You guys knew I was going to say it, (laughs) right? We can do hard things. I can do hard things. What's hard for me mightn't be hard for you. You might be so comfortable sharing about your own struggles and I'm not, but you know, we can do hard things and what's hard for me might be hard for you, but that doesn't mean it's not hard. And then the last piece here is we all have a story. We all have a story. It doesn't matter what it is. We all have been hurt because you just don't get out of childhood without being hurt. That's the truth. Nobody does. We can blame our parents and we can blame X, Y, and Z. And the truth is it's living. I can't protect my children from having difficult times or mental illness. All I can do is be there and make them understand that as soon as something's up, they can tell us because there's no shame. There's no shame in sharing. There's no shame in saying you need help. And so I hope that this reaches any of those goals for you. Before I end, I just want to thank you for holding space for me. Thank you for being a safe place for me to share my story with you. Thank you for receiving it in a gentle and kind way. Thank you for just being a listener because I think one of our core human needs is to be heard, to tell our story and for the person across from us to say, I understand, I I get you, right? I might not know what you're going through, but I hear you and I received your story and I'm going to make some space for your story. We don't even have to change it and make it better. I'm just going to be here and hold your space, right? So thank you so much for holding space for my story. If anything, I hope you just walk away knowing that I get it. This cycle of having fear and Trying to solve it with unhelpful coping strategies is not a new one. We have been doing this for thousands of years, we humans. And so there is no shame. Okay. So thank you so much. Feel free here, I will say before I end, to let me know your thoughts. Go on to the CBT School campus. That's our Facebook group. It's a closed group, so you'll have to request to be in the group. It's called CBT School Campus. And don't be afraid to share with me your thoughts and what it brought up for you, if it was helpful or not helpful. I'm very, very open to your experience of this because I don't usually do this. And I probably won't do this about me for a very long time just because my goal is to just keep powering forward with wonderful tools and wonderful interviews and, you know, a place for you guys to feel held too. All right. So thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving period. Thank you again for your support. And I'll talk to you next week. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.